to episode 223 of the Various Summary Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio, the beautiful campus of Grace College and Theological Seminary, by my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is ready for the end of the world today, John Scott Sloat. It's Eclipse Day. It is. Eclipse Day. Yeah, we're recording before the eclipse. Like an hour. Before the eclipse. Yeah. Like a- so assuming the world doesn't come to an end, this episode will make it out. Yep. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we're, we're under a little bit of a crunch here to make sure we get that uh, – get this recorded and – Over to the watch party. Over to the watch party at the library. Yeah. Outside the library, obviously. I went in 2017. I did not. It was uh, – I don't remember much other than walking outside. It just felt eerie. Yeah. It feels very strange. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yes. Um, Another thing that happened today, you were recognized for your 10 years of service here at Grace College and Theological Seminary. Yep. Yep. Was started as an employee in 2014. Yes. It is now 2024. Yes. Well, okay. So that just counts full time. For full time. Full time employment. Yes. Yep. Yes. Because I was an right. ARD before that, grad yes. assistant. I guess technically doesn't count. Correct. Correct. Yes. Supposedly. Yeah. And a student employee before that. Correct. Really, I've been an employee in some <laughs> scope or fashion since basically 2007. Yeah. Yeah. Except for your year of exile in, mm-hmm. in Louisville. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. It was also noted today as part of your tribute that you began here at Grace as a freshman in 2006. Yeah, that's true. Which is the year I began teaching here at Grace. Yeah, yeah. You were one of those bright-eyed, you know, Yep. Uh, optimistic freshmen coming in. That's right. Yeah. Honestly, I don't think I was bright-eyed or optimistic. I was just like, let me keep my head down and survive. <laughs> that was much more my outlook was survival. Yeah, there you go. All right. Well, if you would like to contact the show and congratulate John Scott Sloat on his 10 years of service, of full-time employment here at Grace, you can reach the show on X at V&S Pod. You can email the show, podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and on YouTube, and we would love for you to leave a five-star rating and a review. I haven't checked lately. I, assume... I haven't checked in weeks. Yeah, I haven't either. So, All right, John, let's talk some sports. Okay. Uh, over the weekend, uh, the final four for yep. the men and yep. the women, but let's talk men first. Uh, so the Saturday games, did you get to watch those, the semifinals? I watched uh, uh, the Purdue game. All right. That was the early game. The early game. And then I went to bed in the midst of the second game. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Thoughts on on what you saw? I I think Purdue looks pretty good. Yeah. They they look tough to beat. Um, They're running into a buzzsaw in UConn who seems almost unbeatable at this point. But we'll see. I think it'll be – I think it's – we often don't get two very good teams that we knew coming in are going to play for the championship. And that feels like what we have. And I feel like they match up reasonably well mm-hmm. in terms of personnel. Um, so I, I hope it's a good, close, competitive game. Um, Which coach do you like better? Oh, Matt Painter. You like Matt Painter better than uh, uh, Dan? Yeah. Dan Hurley? Yeah. Um, why? <laughs> so I, 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 don't... I think you might know why. Tell me why. At the risk of potentially offending some of our listeners, he's got a bit of that Jersey edge to him. Oh, Dan. So Dan over the weekend go, or maybe even today said, the thing I'm most excited, the biggest motivation I have in being here is not dealing with the transfer portal because we're still playing. Yeah. And there's part of me that's like, I get it. Yeah. Like, like that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But it's just, I mean, it's, it's. Exhibit number four million, why the NCAA is just dumb. Mm-hmm. Hold it off till May, the transfer portal. There, there's no yeah. reason that – like that – there's just no reason for it. Yep. It's not like they can go enroll right now. Mm-hmm. So 
uh, th- <laughs> in, in the words of Nate from Ohio, they need to get their heads out of their duffel bags. Mm-hmm. But let's talk about the on-court product. Um, yeah, I mean, by the time this drops, obviously the game will be unplayed. Um, I still think UConn is, is a better team and they'll probably win. I'm rooting for Purdue, though. It feels like Purdue – is it fair to call Purdue a one-trick pony? They well, kind of they kind of give the ball to Edie inside, and if he can work a, a hook shot or some mm-hmm. sort of layup, yeah. he goes for it. If he can't and he gets doubled, he kicks it out and they shoot a three. Does that seem – that seem, it's a very good trick. Yeah. Yeah. But it feels like that's the game plan. Yeah, for sure. It is. Um, I, on my Twitter feed, I see a lot of – you know, a lot of basketball stuff. And there are plenty of people who just, you know, moan and complain about, oh, gosh, Purdue is so boring to watch. I I don't think that. Well, I I don't think that necessarily either. But my response is, who cares? Mm -hmm. It works. Like, the goal is not, ooh, look how pretty. Sure. The goal is, win the game. Yeah. And when you have a 7-4 center, throw the ball inside. Yeah. Yeah, and I, he's just fascinating to me. Like his ability like what makes Purdue interesting to watch is how huge Zach Eady is mm-hmm. and what he does with the ball. And I think he does a I think he's actually a pretty athletic 7-foot-4 guy. I think he is too. Yeah. I mean, he grew up playing tennis and baseball. Mhm. Um so, you know, I I think he is a very athletic guy. I don't know how he'll translate to the to the pros because there just aren't post players like that. I think he he might just be too one dimensional. Yeah. But you're also seven four and you're you're pretty athletic. Like he's he's I think he'll be able to find a spot like maybe as a bench player or something. But yeah, good opportunity for a team to zig when everybody else is zagging. Exactly. You know. I mean. Yeah. I mean, if he can protect the rim and rebound, there are plenty of guys like that in the NBA yep. who are not scorers, and, uh, except for like of offensive rebounds or something. Mm-hmm. Nothing's run for them. Their expectation is you rebound, you protect the rim, and your points come from offensive offensive putbacks. Yeah. There's a place for a guy like that in the NBA. It's hysterical to me that we're talking about a 7-4 guy uh, in the national championship game who dominates – does he have a spot on an NBA team? It's just style, you know? it's style of play. Yeah. It's style of play. So um, it'll be interesting to see uh, what becomes of that. Um, uh, let's – since we're on this top, since we're on the men's side, we should mention just today as we're recording, I think a pretty shocking news development in the world of college basketball. John Calipari leaving Kentucky to go to Arkansas. Yeah, that's pretty wild. It's not wild that he's leaving Kentucky because there was discussion as to whether he'd get fired at the end of this year because mm-hmm. they just – they've won one NCAA tournament game in the last like five years. Yeah. It's – or maybe it's two. Like, But, you know, they've consistently come in as a higher seed and lost. And so a lot of unrest in the uh, Kentucky fan base. So – it was decided they'd keep him, and now out of the blue, he bolts for Arkansas. Yeah. So in the conference, you don't often see interconference yeah. sort of stuff like that. And let's be honest, Arkansas is a very good basketball program, but it's not a blue blood like Kentucky. No, it's not Kentucky. Um, didn't Arkansas win a tournament game? Not not this year, but last year. Probably. Uh, may, probably. I feel like they did in their uh, did their coach rip off his shirt. Like what happened to that guy? Mm-hmm. Do you remember this? I think it was Arkansas. Was that an Arkansas guy? That might have been. I anyway, um, but John Calipari feels like a, a northeastern used car, used car salesman to me. Yeah, for o- sure. Always has, and this yeah. feels very northeastern used car salesman sort of move. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, uh, a tidbit that came out today is. The Ohio State media reporting John Calipari privately expressed interest in the Ohio State job when it came over. How would you feel about that? Would hate it. (laughs) 
hate it. I would be so – like it would, it would cause the existential crisis. Like can I root for this team? Really? That would have been great content for the show. Like, I mean, I mean, can I root for this team? Potentially years of content for this show. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. nutty thing did John Calipari say that has Matt upset now? Yeah. Now, uh, or it could just be the men's basketball program is just dead to me. It's like wow. they don't exist until they get rid of him. You know. Wow. Anyway, who would you root for instead? I don't know if I'd root for anybody. Really? College basketball? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I always have a soft spot in my heart for my alma mater, Ohio University, but they're obviously, you know. They're definitely a step down. They're, they're a mid-major. Yeah. So, Though interestingly enough, Alabama's best player, um, that Mark Sears, mm-hmm. started his college career at Ohio University. Hmm. Um, it's a fun tidbit. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Alabama – the, the stuff I'm seeing is that Nate Oates, the coach of Alabama, is the top target for Kentucky, which would be another in, 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 interconference yeah, yeah. Uh, movement. Wow. Wow. So we'll see. It'll be interesting. Uh, we should also talk briefly about the, uh, about the women's Final Four. Did you watch any of the semifinals or the championship game uh, yesterday? Nope. Okay. Not a lick. I know it's the most watched women's basketball game, women's college basketball game of all time. Yeah. Or uh, 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 Iowa UConn was. Yeah, the semifinal. Yep. Yeah. Very entertaining game. Um, there was one, I guess, bit of controversy. UConn was down one, had the ball with like eight seconds left. And, oh, this is the moving screen. And uh, yeah. they were LSU was called for a moving screen, and people lost their minds. And then when you see the replay, it is so obviously a moving screen. The yeah. only thing I can see there is – you have to be biased to not see that as a moving screen. Yeah. But anyway. Um, and then championship game yesterday, South Carolina beats uh, Iowa by 12. Mm-hmm. Um, they were definitely the better team. Yeah. Caitlin Clark was the best player on the floor, but uh, not enough to overcome the overall team dynamics. Uh, I watched that game and – South Carolina just destroyed them on the offensive glass. Like hmm. the second half, it felt like their South Carolina's whole offense was basically just shoot the ball and we'll get the offensive rebound. Doesn't matter how good the shot is, just throw it up towards the rim hmm. and we'll go get it and lay it in. Hmm. That's tough to beat. So, um, yeah, South Carolina, your women's Division One national title winner. Uh, we got to talk bracket. Yeah, bracket challenge on the men's side. Uh, Number one, you just want to do top five here? Well, I, or should we do top six? It's up to you. I mean, really, as far as I can tell, only two people can win it. Yes, I believe that is true. So uh, at number one, we have Joel from Ohio. Yeah. Uh, and if UConn wins tonight, he wins. He wins. Uh, number two, we have uh, Dave, my father in law. Yeah, how about that? He did very well, but he cannot win. He cannot win. Because uh, he has he has UConn winning as well. Yeah. So uh, obviously Joel being a single point of head will yeah. hop him. Yep. Uh, and then uh, in third place we have uh, Jason. Do I know? He goes to our church. Yes. Why am I blanking on that? I'll tell you after. Okay. Um, uh, but he has Purdue winning, and if Purdue wins, I believe he jumps. Yes. Both of them. He would win. Yes. So it's either. Jason, who goes by uh, Hick Sensation. Yes, that's his last name is the, the first four letters there. And um, and Joel from Ohio. Those are the only two who can win it. That's right. Uh, then also tied for third in terms of points is Aaron. Uh, who will be fourth. Who will be fourth, yes. Uh, and then fifth, Ash. Yep, in my small group. Who he would move up to third. If if UConn wins, that's right. And then you are sitting there at sixth. And yep. if UConn wins, that means you would be in fourth. You'd finish yep. fourth. Yep. Okay. Solid work there, John. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my son notified me that we misidentified his bracket last week. Oh no! So we're issuing a correction. Is that what's what what's happening right now? Uh, well, I, I I'm not sure which bracket is his to be honest. 
Um, but uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, I, I managed to cement my last place finish of those who completed a bracket. Um, so the the uh, the highest finisher in the family looks like it's going to be um, believe. Or actually, we should give a shout out to Nate in Ohio's. If you if you come wins, he'll move up to the top five. Uh, well, maybe not. Fifth, uh, sixth, maybe. Are you talking He's about Nathan? Mm, uh, that is not Nate in Ohio, I don't believe. I believe that's Nathan, vice president here at Grace. Is that really? Yeah. I okay. mean, there is a Greek reference in there. Well, that's what made me think. My bad. Okay. Well, anyway. Well, you know what? I, I don't know that there's another Nate, so maybe it is. I could be wrong. All that to say, it's going to come down to Joel in Ohio or um, Jason. Jason in Indiana. In Indiana. Okay. All right. Dum dum dum. The oh. drama. Yeah. Yeah. The drama. So, um, well, the, the the good thing is it, we can easily reach out to them. We can get a hold of either of them. Yeah. I can text either of them. Yes. Uh, we should probably say something about the NBA because there's like a week left in the season. Is it all? Is that all? Before we left? get to the to the play in tournament. Hmm. And the. Uh, Let's see where where are your Knicks at, John? Uh, they're like tied for third right now in the East. Uh, looks like they are record wise tied for third, but they put them in the fourth spot. So they must not have the tiebreaker with. Yeah, them. yeah. Um, but they lost Julius Randle, correct? So Julius Randle's been out for like three months already. Okay, uh, but, but they, it was just announced that he's not coming back. He's having shoulder surgery. So okay. uh, that leaves us – we are we did get OG back. We did get Mitchell Robinson back and we have Jalen yeah. Brunson. So I I think we could go around maybe two in the NBA playoffs. I don't think we can win the whole thing without yeah. Julius Randle. But I like the team that they've built. They, they're a lot of fun to watch. I don't Have you watched any Knicks basketball this not year? Not really. Not really. I mean outside of shots of James Dolan, they're a, they're a, they're a pure <laughs> joy uh, to watch. Uh, uh, Jalen Brunson uh, is a lot of fun. Well, <clears throat> it will be a rematch. As of now, it would be a rematch between the Knicks and the Cavs from last year in round one, mm-hmm. a series that the Knicks won. Um, so that could be an interesting development. Uh, Celtics, Bucks, Magic, Knicks, Cavs, Pacers, Sixers, Heat, and then the uh, yeah Bulls and Hawks round that out. Um the West, though, is uh, even more um, – what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, bunched up, I guess, right? So currently, as of today, you have Minnesota and Denver tied okay. with apparently Minnesota getting the nod um, for, the, for the top spot. Then you have the Thunder, the Clippers, and the Mavericks. And uh, it's one of those things where it's, there's about a game difference between each – a game or two difference between each spot. So there's still room for, for some movement. Um, the big thing I'm keeping my eyes on – well, I guess that's settled now. Uh, I think the Warriors have now clinched the 10th spot. Yeah, I think the, I think the Rockets – Because the Rockets are, lost yesterday. I mean they're too far out. Um, so you could have Lakers Warriors in the play-in game, play-in tournament. One one game to to move forward. I see. Here's here's my theory. I think I think when the NBA front office looks at these standings in the West, they're they are terrified. Oh, because Minnesota, Denver, none of those are big markets. I guess the Clippers, but I mean that's. But uh, the, but the nobody Clippers. nobody cares about the Clippers in L.A. Dallas, Dallas is a big market. Eh. Phoenix, not a not a huge market. Well, but but I think they have enough talent. You also need to keep in. Take you into need account, stars, like star power. Yeah, and Phoenix has a lot of stars potentially. Mm-hmm. So, um, the Pelicans. Nobody cares about the Pelicans uh, or the Kings or the Kings. Lakers and Warriors, people yeah. care about. Yeah. So, just interesting. I, I don't think that bodes well for the for the NBA playoff ratings. Um, yeah, in the, 
In the east, I'm looking at uh, Boston's a big poll. Huge. New York's a big poll. Yep. Milwaukee. <laughs> but they have Giannis. They have Giannis Antetokounmpo and, and uh, Damian Lillard. Dil- Damian Lillard. Yep. Um, so they have, they have some some star power there. Cavs. I don't think so. Donovan I, Mitchell. A mm. little bit, but he's he's pretty banged up, isn't he? He's yeah. not he's not super healthy. Uh, Pacers. I don't think anybody cares. About. No. I mean. In Obviously, Indiana. locally, yeah. yes. Seventy Sixers. I think people care. Yes, but they're well down there, right? Is that what is that? Sixth, Seven, seventh. seventh? Uh, the Heat. Big market, but who's the star there? Uh, Jimmy. Is it Jimmy Butler still? Yeah. Does he draw? Does he draw eyeballs? It feels know. like in the playoffs he does. Maybe but, I don't know. And then the Bulls. Again, though, who's their star? Yeah, they're a big market. Yeah. Um. The Hawks and uh, the Pistons. All right, and you've shut off your phone to look at records. Yeah. Do you know the Pistons' record right now? I don't. They're bad. They're I mean, real bad. Have they won? Have they won more than ten games? Yes. Okay. Twelve. A little bit more. Fifteen. A little less. It's thirteen. Thirteen games. So they so they've won thirteen games, and they've, there's probably what four games left for them. Yeah, they've lost sixty five games. <laughs> Gosh. So they can't, but they can't get to seventy. Then, I guess the not, most no. losses they can have is sixty nine. No, they are forty nine games back in the East. <laughs> That's an absurd number. The Wizards aren't far behind. The Wizards are forty seven and a half games behind in the so East. So bad, so bad. The Hornets are forty three. Ga- they're, they're all bad. Yeah, they're all bad. Yep. All right, John, we got to move on. You ready to move on? I suppose. I mean, we didn't do our extended baseball segment like we talked about, but whatever. Another day. (laughs) Another day. All right. We are continuing on in our series in uh, Jay Gresham Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. Uh, Last week, we discussed the first two chapters. This week, the next two. So last week, the two chapters uh, dealt with – Basically, uh, the first is introduction, just kind of setting the stage for what he was dealing with. And the second one was a chapter on doctrine in general. Today's chapter is uh, one on God and man and the other on the Bible. So, by the way, I was just flipping through. Did, uh, well, you're listening to this. And so I am listening to this. He dedicated the book to his mom. Did he really? Yeah. To my mother. Oh. What a guy. Yeah. What a guy. He's a softie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think of when I think of Machen. Yeah, softy. Yeah, Machen. Yeah, man. Just, just a a big old teddy bear. Um, okay, so uh, just to set the stage, uh, Machen wrote this book, published in uh, 1923, dealing with uh, the rise of religious um, liberalism, mm-hmm. and um, in particular, main lines. Going mm-hmm. liberal in terms of their uh, theology. Yes, and he's not necessarily calling out political liberals, and he's not necessarily calling out classical liberals, right? I mean, Correct. he's calling out these theological liberals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's there, there's a Venn diagram. There is a made Venn out there, absolutely of overlapping uh, circles. But uh, yes, he is. Um, He's responding to the sort of uh, social gospel movement Mm -hmm. among mainline Protestants who are abandoning doctrine, uh, abandoning uh, biblical beliefs in an effort to make religion usable Mm -hmm. for the common man, for the modern man who can't – doesn't have any place for, you know, supernatural things, just needs Mm -hmm. a practical religion. Yeah. Something that – we can hang on to the ethics of, of Christianity, but you know some of the doctrine, of course, needs to be jettisoned. And what did you make of this chop, chapter on God and man? Well, I mean, he starts off the chapter by essentially identifying that um, uh, it's an interesting statement: the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man are the two great presuppositions of the gospel. That basically, if you don't have a proper doctrine of God. In a proper doctrine of man, you're not going to get the gospel right. Mm-hmm. And I cer- he's certainly correct about that. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean half the chapter's on – Yeah, it's almost like it's God. two chapters together here yeah. almost. Yeah, I mean it makes me think a little bit about um, 
you know, Calvin basically, I think, is one of the first to clearly articulate this, at least that I can re- recall, is the idea that you can't rightly know yourself unless you know God, and you can't rightly know God unless you know your you know yourself at some like the, mm-hmm. basically the knowledge of God and the knowledge of of yourself and humanity are intertwined. Yeah, and if you get one wrong, you're almost certainly going to get the other one wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's the point that Machen's really trying to make here. Um, yeah, it does echo those early institutes for sure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so what do you? What did you make of his take on sort of the, 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 the god of liberal theology as he, as he lays it out here? Yeah. Um, I thought he did a really interesting job of highlighting how much they love to talk God as father, but God is nothing else, not God as judge or God as, any, as yeah. um, any, anything else. He goes, well, this has a sort of the veneer of mm-hmm. biblical authority and biblical fidelity, but actually yeah. here's where they're missing the mark. And yeah. uh yeah, I, I thought that was really interesting to talk through. And I mean, through this, we've been trying to even look at our own times mm-hmm. and yeah. engage with that. And uh, I had I had an easier time doing it with his doctrine of man, mm-hmm. but a little bit harder of a time doing it with doctrine of God. Yeah, though I think it's I, I I think it's still there in terms of I mean you. You hear it in political rhetoric. Mm-hmm. You hear it in um, just I think pop culture in in terms of just this just vague sense of of all of us are God's children, which is another way of talking about the fatherhood of God, I suppose, at one level. Yeah, um, and that's just not biblically true. Well, and how I made the connection was if you watch sitcoms or or uh, uh, dramas, there's sort of this like understanding of the universe or sort of this uh, benevolent force in the mm-hmm. world. And I think that's similar to what he's getting at here with, uh, yeah. with sort of God as father, but sort of um, God as – what's the right word? Almost like almost like God in a, in a you know, rocking chair on a front porch <laughs> at a Cracker Barrel, you know, <laughs> s- spouting out wise things and – yeah, just being like, "Oh, you darned kids!" You know, you know, with a smile on his yeah. face and yeah. uh, sort of this ultimate loving creature, nostalgic creature, yeah, um, and yeah. not as like this sort of all powerful right. judge of the Bible that we see. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it might have been A. W. Tozier who who framed it this way that basically um, there there's this there's this dynamic where. The biblical picture is you have to hold together God's transcendence, mm-hmm. his otherness, his above us, his greatness, and God's imminence. He is he is near us, and mm-hmm. for believers, he is inside of us through the Spirit. Um, and uh, that that given moments in culture tend to swing between those extremes. That a culture can get so caught up in the transcendence of God, he's un it's like you can't relate to him. But if you go too far on the imminence end of things, then you've domesticated him. Mm-hmm. He's just your buddy. Yeah. The man upstairs. Mm-hmm. You know, the big guy upstairs. Yeah. You know. Jesus is my homeboy, yeah. sort of. Uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and so I think, you know, it, there's a there's a dynamic in here where He's he's basically trying to address this from a different angle, um, and and part of it is he he, he points out that the, the sort of God as Father is like the only doctrine of God they have. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Full stop. And he's like, well, the the Bible has a a much richer, obviously, doctrine of God, and one component is he's the Father, he's the Father of of Jesus Christ, and he's the Father of his people, Mm -hmm. but he's also judge and redeemer and all those other aspects of his character that that are essential to his identity. Yeah. How how do you see this changed in sort of a modern way? Um, Like like how do you see the doctor? So when I – when I've had conversations with um, people that would uh, claim Christianity Mm -hmm. that are a little bit more – uh, postmodern, maybe in their their philosophical outlook than I am. 
one of the things they say to me is like, John, you're just too definite on things. You're just too certain about things about the Father. God is a God of mis- uh, of mystery, and I'm mm-hmm. just really okay with the mystery of God and sitting in that tension. And yeah, uh, yeah. There's part of me that's just like that. That seems to be a twist on this that has come mm-hmm. in the postmodern world, or maybe the post postmodern world, wherever we are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, do you see that as well? Sort of, sort of that. Uh, yeah. Mis- maybe a little bit different than than what he's dealing with uh, in the 1920s. Yeah, I, I I think that's right. I would tie it both to the chapter before on doctrine, uh-huh. because our, our our sort of cultural moment is loathe to make definitive statements about God, other than just you know generalities. Mm-hmm. Um. And I would tie it to the chapter that comes next in terms of the Bible yeah. because they want to reject the Bible's authority. Mm-hmm. And so um, then it's just up to your own sort of feeling and sensibility as to what seems right mm-hmm. to you. Um, so I think uh, – which I do think that leads into the doctrine of man that he gets at, which it's funny if there's anything that uh, – you know sort of the the cultural moment we live in it's you know captured well by the by the expression expressive individualism right mm-hmm. and you know guys like Carl Truman have done a great job of 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 tracing how that's developed and it's it's almost intriguing to step back in time 100 years and kind of see the snapshot when he talks about the doctrine of man um and to see how how what Machen talks about anticipates where we're at today, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of the oh that was in an earlier phase of this larger trajectory. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what what was what most resonated with you in the uh, the very postmodern way to put it, um, <laughs> but on the on the section dealing with man. Mm-hmm. Was there anything particular, particular, particular that stuck out? Yeah, um, I was struck by he he identifies what's happening in his day as um, as a return to paganism. Yeah, yeah, that was a fascinating and turn, wasn't it? Like there are people out there today who are making that same claim and acting like it's this like kind of new insight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh. Our culture's turning, you know, returning to paganism. And like, here's Machen a hundred years earlier, going like, "We're already going back to paganism." Like, it's more in full flower than it was, in part because I think, um, in Machen's day, there was still a cultural respectability to being loosely associated with Christianity, mm-hmm. and that is no longer the case in in many parts of our culture. So it's funny. He he almost says that in uh, the previous paragraph when when speaking about where he says in speaking of paganism in the previous paragraph he says uh, the change is nothing less than a substitution of paganism for Christianity as the dominant view of life. Seventy five years ago, Western civilization, despite inconsistencies, I assume he's talking about slavery. There, that would be yeah, my guess. Probably, uh, we still uh, was still predominantly Christian. Today, it's predominantly pagan. It's funny to talk to. Uh, People, goodness, probably people in their 60s and 70s being like, mm-hmm. boy, back in my day, America was a Christian nation. And yeah. here, here's this guy <laughs> saying, boy, back in the 1850s, right. <laughs> America was a Christian nation. Yeah. Or, or the world, the Western civilization yeah. was a Christian nation. What do you make of that? Is that just like a side effect of getting older in the changing world? or like? What? I'm sure some of that's in, in play. In some ways, I think they're talking about different things. Okay. Meaning, I think, I think in Machen's day, it was, it's still fair to say that the broad Judeo-Christian framework mm-hmm. was the assumption for the vast majority of the culture. Not necessarily act, not saying active faith, mm-hmm. but I'm saying if you said God, they thought the Christian God. Yes. You know, if you started talking about like specific kind of doctrines, they would think of the Christian form of that as sort mm-hmm. of the starting point. Yeah. Now that's not the case. At least I think in 
significant portions of our culture. Again, we've mm-hmm. talked about this before that it's a different animal in you know the Bible Belt South than it is in you know New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. You know, very different contexts. Uh, so I think I think that's part of the difference. I think what yeah. Machen is saying is he's trying to claim there was more piety, more devotion, more genuine Christianity 75 years before him than in his day. Mm-hmm. When people today say we are becoming pagan, I think it's the it's less about the personal devotion and it's more about the the larger frameworks of assumptions that that inform our culture. Hmm. That'd be my guess. What what and I believe it's in this section although oh there it is. Uh in this section where he goes to, I believe, World War I mm-hmm. as sort of a, uh, one of the maybe um, world events that has influenced this. Yeah. Uh, what, what did you think of that? That, that was interesting uh, to read through. Yeah. It, it's, it, well, it, part of what's strange to me is like reading anything between World War I and World War II. It's fascinating. It's always fascinating. Yes, yes, yes. Because obviously now we know what's coming down yes, the road. Yes, yes. And they're coming out of World War One. like, oh, my gosh, that was so terrible. Like who can imagine something we can't like that do that ever again. happening again? <laughs> and it's like here we are, you know, 15 years later and it's starting back up. Um, I don't know. Like I, I wasn't sure what to make of that. Um, part of what he does go into after that though is this idea of – consciousness of sin yeah that um that the, that the war dulled us to this yes exactly mm-hmm. um that in one sense maybe it's the idea that the, the sort of the war the, the scope of evil on the on, on was so, was so massive that people became dull to their own personal sin mm-hmm. so that was that was my take uh i just want to quote uh um him sort of mocking uh, the present day preacher, um, yeah. wh- where uh, uh, the preacher gets up into his pulpit, opens the Bible, and addresses the congregation somewhat as follows You people are very good. You <laughs> yeah. respond to every appeal that looks towards the welfare of the community. Now we have in the Bible, especially in the life of Jesus, something so good. That we believe it is good enough even for you good people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I love the I love the sarcasm. Oh, there. dripping. Dripping with sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of the Bible, you ready to move on? We have to. to, to yeah. yeah, we we have to. Well, I mean, if, if we want to make the eclipse. I yeah. mean, look at the time. I mean. Uh so yes. <clears throat> it is fascinating to see in one sense. The similarities of how the Bible comes under attack today versus how it was mm-hmm. under attack then. Um, I, I would say one difference, uh, just in light of knowing what we know about the, about his time period, he doesn't really get into this here, though I think it's kind of talked about elsewhere, is I think in Machen's day, the, one of the biggest stumbling blocks was the supernatural. Mm-hmm. How can modern man – immersed in the scientific method, believe that water can turn to wine or that a man can walk on water or that you can multiply a few loaves of bread to feed 5,000. That's impossible to believe for the modern man. Or raised from the dead. Or, or yeah, exactly. You know, fill in the blank, yeah. Um, I don't think that's the same stumbling block it, it, it was then. The no. supernatural. Yeah, I, I think people are way more comfortable with supernatural yes, stuff now. Yes, 100%. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing that you and I don't have to fight against that in, in the classroom quite as much. It feels like yeah. something that's accepted a bit more. Yeah. I mean I think that's a bit that's a big uh a big difference. Um I, one thing ahead. that's a little bit different, um uh, it, it appears to be so as I as I listened through this chapter, it kept sounding like, well, we wanna we wanna break off pieces of the Bible. We wanna get mm-hmm. rid of some of these things and sort yep. of boil it down to to the values of Christianity, but not yep. this is not inspired. Yeah. Um we have what's cropped up today seems to be and, and this just came out over the weekend, somebody trying to say, like, here's the biblical case for fill in the blank sinful thing. Mm-hmm. Here's the biblical case for LGBTQ, or here's the biblical case for yep. uh um transgenderism or, you know, fill in the blank. And 
That doesn't seem to be going on uh, in his world, as far as I can tell, people using the Bible to justify uh, their sinful behavior. Correct. And they just say to be like, well, is the Bible really the the, right. the inspired word of God? You know. Yeah, th- there's there's an element, and I think I I pointed this out last week. In Machen's day, you had people who wanted to hang on to the morality and the ethics and yeah. ditch the doctrine. Mm-hmm. Today, it's almost flipped. There's a contingency that's flipped that, that they want to claim to be – Bible believing Christians, but they want to jettison the you know certain aspects. Read sexual ethics. They they want to jettison that, sure, or redefine it essentially. So I mean I, I think I, I think that's that is a major difference. Yeah, between Machen's day and our day. Oh yeah. Um, what do you make? Uh, he went on a he went on a uh, several paragraphs on uh, verbal plenary inspiration. Yeah, I don't think that I was necessarily <laughs> expecting that, but that seemed to be a target uh, sure. for a number of people. That feels much less like a target today, in some ways. Um, but specifically, I, I think inspiration is a target, but the the actual verbal plenary yeah. inspiration is. Like, I don't hear those words a ton like I used to. Yeah, like I used to. Like I'm old enough to. Yeah. <laughs> Live in the 1920s. Yes. Well, I think um, he doesn't use the term inerrancy, by the way. But mm. that's that's clearly what he's getting at. Yeah. Like he's combining inspira- verbal plenary inspiration and infallibility. So even though he doesn't use the term inerrancy, that's what he's getting at, that the Bible mm. is without errors. Um, but see, here, another, here's another difference. In Machen's day, it was – um, there are errors in the Bible. Mm-hmm. So we got to expose those. Today, it's your interpretation of the Bible is in error. Mm-hmm. The Bible's fine. If you, but if you rightly understand the Bible, it actually affirms, you know, my preferred <laughs> LGBTQ. Yeah, all of my preconceived notions. Yeah, yeah, it actually affirms those things. All of my priors. I mean, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but over the weekend, um, it was brought to, to the attention. So Richard Hayes. Yeah, that's who I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, world-class New Testament scholar of his generation. He's, he's got to be in his 70s by now. E- Echoes of Scripture and Paul was yeah. a groundbreaking Done work. Groundbreaking right? work. But even before – well, even – and then after that, one of his most uh, significant works was the moral vision of the New Testament, hmm. which was basically laying out uh, kind of a, a New Testament ethics. Hmm. And in that book, he reluctantly – comes to the conclusion that the Bible prohibits homosexual relationships. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's down at what? Duke Divinity Duke, School, yeah. right? But that came out in 1996. Okay. So coming up on 30 years. And now, in a book that's about to be released, he he is he's changed his mind on that. He Except- now thinks that the New Testament allows for that. Hmm. That there's a as as they put as he and his son wrote this interestingly enough. Yes. Um, that there's a wideness in God's mercy. The expanding the mercy of God, I yeah. think, is the, yeah. the title. Yeah. So we should have him on. We should, we should read the book this summer and uh, bring uh, – Did you – I don't know if I told you. He was almost my external reader for my dissertation. Really? Yeah, almost. He, he would have been great he, he for you. He had to turn it down. He had to turn it down. But oh, he, that, that would have been quite a feather in the cap. <laughs> it would have been fun. Who knows where your career would have gone? <laughs> I don't, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm blown away. That's the biggest news of the day, and there's an eclipse later. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> um, so next week, do we decide what we're doing? I think two more chapters. How, how many chapters we got left? There's three left. Do we decide? Um, boy, one of those is big. Is one? Of, is it the last one? No, it's the middle one, unfortunately. Of course. of course it is. You want to do the next? Let's do Christ and salvation, and then we'll do church and then big picture reflections. Let's do okay. that. Okay. Let's do that. So the next, next two, two chapters. Yep. All right. Time now for This Day in Sports History. All right. This Day in Sports History, April 9th, uh, 2024, April 9th. Eclipse, uh, yeah. The day after the eclipse. The day after the eclipse. <laughs> uh, 1974, San Diego Padres – by the way, the Padres' like uniform and uh, like the the friar hitting a baseball, mm-hmm. it's so good. Mm-hmm. 
It's so good. Uh, San Diego Padres owner Ray Kroc mm-hmm. addresses fans, ladies and gentlemen, no, ladies and gentlemen, boy, ladies and gentlemen, I suffer with you. I've never seen such stupid baseball playing in my life. Can you imagine your owner coming out and saying that? I'm a Mets fan. I could. <laughs> okay. I absolutely could. Uh, 1978, Denver's David Thompson uh, battling San Antonio's George Gervin for the NBA season scoring title scores 73 points against the Detroit Pistons. Must have been playing the 2024 Detroit Pistons. Yeah. It's the third highest uh, output ever in an NBA game. Gervin, not to be out then, later scored 63 against the Jazz. No, the New Orleans. The New Orleans Jazz. Which makes more sense than Utah. Oh, 100%. I'm not sure Jazz has ever been played in Utah. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, it's just enough to give Gervin the scoring crown 27.22 points per game to Thompson's 27.15, the tightest one to fish, one to finish ever. Do you know either of those men's nicknames? I think George Gervin's is gettable. David Thompson's is harder. I wouldn't know David Thompson's. Um, I can't. I've definitely heard George Gervin's. Yeah. What? What is it? He's the Ice Man. The Ice Man. <laughs> uh, and David Thompson was Skywalker, Skywalker because of his jumping ability. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what year was this? So this would have been right around uh, late seventies. Right yeah, around, right uh, around the Star release, Wars. The release okay. of the first one. Uh, 1994, former Chicago Bulls shooting guard Michael Jordan made his professional baseball de- debut, uh, going hitless for the White Sox Double A Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham, excuse me, <laughs> Birmingham got Mets on the brain. There you go. Uh, 1994. Yeah. Uh, during his suspension, right, his year-long suspension from basketball. <laughs> okay, conspiracy. Yeah. Um, 2001, Australia set a record for the most one-sided international win, the most one-sided international win in FIFA history, beating the Tonga 22-0 in Oceania Group 1 qualifying match for the 2002 World Cup. That's a lot of, that's a lot of goals. That's a lot of goals. Um, the 2002 World Cup, wasn't that an Olympic year, Sydney, Australia? Uh. Well, summer Olympics are always, are in the uh, like two thousand. It would be two thousand, two thousand four, two thousand. Okay, so it's the two thousand then. Okay, okay. Uh, Twenty sixteen, uh, Drake, uh, Caligula. <laughs> I want to say Caligula. <laughs> I know. Um, scores twice in the third period, and Brock Bozer uh, has a goal and three assists to help North Dakota win its eighth NCAA hockey championship, five one. Over top seeded Quinnipiac. Yeah. Okay. I was waiting for. I, I thought I heard a, a, a little breath that indicated to me that I mispronounced <laughs> something. Uh, all right. Who do you like? I like Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc. Let's the first task of a leader is to define reality, and I believe he did that with that sentence. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I suffer with you. I've never seen such stupid baseball playing in my life. There you go. Defining reality. One thing you liked. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna put out another TV show. Um, it's a network television show, uh, but it's called Ghost. Have you heard of this? Yes. Uh, there there is occasional content, um, so be warned. But this couple moves from Manhattan out to Long Island and or maybe Connecticut, and they inherit uh, this giant mansion and go to uh, basically open a bread and bed and breakfast there and uh, the, while they're looking at it initially all these ghosts are walking around just like oh don't do that that's stupid and they're all from these different eras uh, of the house going all the way back to like Native Americans who were there that who died on the property a Viking you know all, all uh-huh. these people who died on the property okay and uh, and uh, the woman uh, falls down the stairs as they're leaving and do- clinically dies for several minutes mm-hmm they revive her, and when she comes back to this house, she's able to see and interact with the ghost. Oh, okay. Um, and so it's like this whole thing. The hu- the husband is, just, is a world-class chef, and so he's cooking at the bed and breakfast. And he's just like, are you talking to ghosts again? <laughs> Which ones are in the room right now? You know, it's it's a very it's a very funny show, and they yeah. have some funny and some heartwarming moments. What platform is that on? 
Uh, that's CBS, so it's uh, be Paramount. Paramount Plus. Okay. All right. Uh, for me, uh, I'm going to go with Saturday. I'm going to hit it from two different angles. Uh, one is it was my oldest son's birthday. Nice. And so we had celebrated the weekend before, so he was uh, not with us. But um, And just the lovely weather. And so we fired up the grill for the first time this nice. spring. Grilled some steaks for dinner and mm. enjoyed those as we, as we watched the uh, Purdue-NC State game. Mm. It was delightful. I mowed the grass for the first. Have you mowed the grass? Uh, it's it's on my to do list this upcoming weekend. Okay, that and submit my taxes. Yeah, no, I have done that. both now. Yeah, well, you, I have a cheat code when it comes to taxes. You do, yes, yes, yes. I, maybe I need to avail myself to your cheat code. I, I can't afford your, how much your dad would cost probably to do my taxes, but he might he might do it uh, he might do it at a at a very reasonable cost. All right, well. All right. Well, 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 Scott in Indiana, if you want to reach out to me and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can broker it. Probably not this year. Well, yeah, uh, but, it's, too but, late. No, but, no, it's too late. But no. Probably next year. I'll, I'll reach out and see, you know, okay. test the waters a bit. Yeah. He sits down on like a this past weekend. He sat down. I think he did like 10 people's taxes or something, something like that. OK. Yeah. I might need to I might want to have a conversation with with your dad. Just big picture ballpark stuff of of. Things I can be doing to maybe limit my tax liability in these days. <laughs> so, but that is my one thing I liked. Okay, John, we have talked basketball. We have talked uh, Christianity and liberalism, part two. We have talked Ray Kroc. We have talked about the show's called Ghosts. Ghost. And uh, we've talked about grilling steaks on a lovely spring afternoon. And of course, we've talked about the end of the world with the uh, yeah we, coming. We need uh, to get to it, yeah, by the way. Yeah. So uh, if, if this is our last broadcast, uh, we want to thank you for listening for these 223 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody will be around to uh, upload it. Upload. Yeah. 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 So, John, we have uh, done what we always do on this program. Uh, we have ver- wandered through our various and sundry topics. And so all that's left to say is until next time. Shall real good. Later. <laughs>